So, we're going to go ahead and start. And I'm, uh, I'm always curious when I, when I put this topic out there in the world, I'm always curious why people actually come. <laughs> Because I'm, and I'm gonna, I, I want to hear your stories, and then I'm going to tell you my story, why I got engaged in, in mysticism. So why, what, what is it about mysticism that draws you to, uh, to come to a class? Madonna. Huh? Madonna. Madonna. <laughs> you know, well that, that was, you know, one aspect of, you know, hearing, hearing about it. Okay. You, because you're not going to be here that long. Find technology. Doesn't later. matter what it is, you're <laughs> showing yes, up. Exactly. That's almost correct. <laughs> <laughs> and I have gone to Kabbalah lectures in the past that were totally incomprehensible. Okay. okay. <laughs> so I'm hoping that this that will make a little bit more sense than someone Hopefully. else. Okay. What brings you out, Mike? Well, I've kind of touched on it in the research I've done in other religions, and I'm kind of, I know very little about art, and I don't know more. Okay. Paul? Well, I've been similar, mm -hmm. uh, doing a spiritual thing, like, like a whole uh, encompassing, what is everybody thinking about the subject? Mm -hmm. and, uh, my cabal is about 1%. I want to learn more about not just that, but the mystical things that, that we have in, in our world. Okay. okay. What other mystical things? Um, in 1978, I was at the University of Texas. And I was registering for classes. And I came across this class in Jewish mysticism. And I said, I wonder what that is. <laughs> I grew up in a very rational, reform environment. We never heard the word Kabbalah or mysticism ever uttered by our rabbi, who was a super rationalist, 1940 educated reform rabbi. And I was curious, but I didn't register for it. Later that year, I got an invitation to go to Cincinnati, to Hebrew Union College. And they had a weekend for college students. I didn't know much about it. I, was, I had a free weekend. I, my, mom, my, my parents said, yeah, we'll send you. And you know, I bought a ticket and I flew to Cincinnati for the weekend and the theme weekend was Kabbalah. And I sat there in a class. It actually wasn't a class, it was Havdalah. Bon Yashur was the, was the director of liturgical music for Hebrew College. And his wife, Fanshon, what a name, F-A-N-C-H-O-N, Fanshon. Bonia was Bulgarian, I think Fanchon was French. But Fanchon was a dancer. And so we had this Havdalah thing, you know, a bunch of college kids sitting around in the, big, in the, in the, in the sanctuary, um, chapel area at the college. And Fanchon starts floating around and doing this kind of interpretive dance based on the idea of the Sabbath bride. Kind of like L'chadodi would be interpreted if you 
put it to, to some kind of dance. And I leaned over to a guy that ultimately became my roommate our first year in Israel. And I said, I think I've fallen off the turnip truck. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I can't believe I'm sitting here in Cincinnati, Ohio, watching this, and I said it, freak show. <laughs> and I left, you know, it was like the weekend was over, and I said, Gnug, I'm done. <laughs> so the next fall, I signed up for the Kabbalah class. And from that point on, I was hooked. And I don't know why I was hooked, or what really hooked me. Well, I would say that originally I was hooked because I was convinced the people that wrote this stuff were on something so powerful that I had to get my hands on it. <laughs> but that wasn't the case. Actually, it was the case. What they were on was something even greater. And so I suddenly began to start exploring Kabbalah through my own reading. I wasn't, I wasn't even headed to rabbinic school at that time. I was going to be a lawyer, I was going to go to law school and do all that stuff. But there was something in that philosophy, theology stuff of Kabbalah that drew me in. And for the last 35 years, I've been kind of engaged with it. I bought this book this week. <laughs> I found it so humorous that I had to buy it. But while I found it humorous, I want to share with you the introduction. Kabbalah is the theology of the Jewish people. It is the way Judaism understands God and the relationship between God and the world. For Kabbalists, those who practice Kabbalah, all the laws, customs, practices, holidays, and rituals of Judaism are best understood in light of the Kabbalistic teachings about God and of what it is that God wants from humans. So Kabbalah is this what? What is Kabbalah? This word Kabbalah comes from the, the Hebrew word the Hebrew root, kuf, bet, lamed, kabel, which means to receive. So the word kabbalah, in and of itself, describes the oldest Jewish transmission of idea, receiving from one generation to the next. Long before there was written evidence of any kind of theological expo ex exploration, there was a received tradition, storytelling. And Kabbalah is filled with the telling of a story. And the most powerful story is the marriage of God and Israel. And everything in Kabbalah is about that. Kabbalah is intensely sexual because it describes this relationship incredibly 
intimate relationship very graphically. It is intensely personal because it's how you individually as a person of Israel are a part of this marriage with God. And everything in Kabbalah, all of its layers, all of its strangeness, and we'll look at some of the really remarkable strangeness of Kabbalah, is all about this intense, personal, intimate relationship. And the purpose of the Kabbalist is to comprehend that. And so it's going to use every, you know, the Kabbalist is going to use everything in his or her power to understand that divine relationship. So when we think of Kabbalah as spirituality, and a lot of people do, so, you know, I don't like the, sem the services, they're boring, I want spirituality, what is spirituality? Kabbalah, that's spiritual. They have no idea what spirituality is. They just think of these words, you know. Spirituality is, you know, more singing, more spirit. That's <laughs> spirituality. For, for most people, Kabbalah represents a, a deeper level of interaction in this relationship. Yes. In the uh, his history of uh, Judaism, when did Kabbalah come along and Israel was around before Kabbalah? Mm -hmm. so, <clears throat> the so the timeline is a little bit Problematic. All right? It's problematic because most Kabbalistic documents, discussions, focus on this relationship from the very first created moment. All right, so you can't you can't see this like timeline that you know there was Torah and we read Torah and then all of a sudden there was Kabbalah because the problem is Kabbalah says there is a Kabbalistic way of reading everything that existed before and everything that will exist since. So, if we wanted to think historically, most of the Kabbalistic texts which we'll look at are second, third centuries of the Common Era. The major text that we'll look at is the Zohar, which is 13th century of the Common Era. Um, but even the, you know, and, and Kabbalists will say, even though that's when you see the text emerge, it was a received tradition long before the text emerged. So it was. Kabbalah before it was Ketuvah. It was received generation to generation before it was written down. People who aren't Jewish, what do they get from Kabbalah? So that's a great question. Because everything they're doing is a violation of the very essence of Kabbalah which begins with the understanding that Kabbalah is the 
level above mitzvah. So in order to engage Kabbalah, or to understand it, first you have to be fluent in mitzvah. Madonna doesn't know squat from mitzvah. All right? You know, the, the Kabbalah Center in California that populated Kabbalistic classrooms with non-Jews of various denomination backgrounds did such a great disservice to the actual essence of Kabbalah that, you know, we can't, well, we can't turn back that clock. What are they searching for? They're searching for this relationship. They consider themselves part of Israel, even though they're really not. They're seeking that intimate relationship of the marriage between God and themselves. They think it rests in the texts of Kabbalah, and it does, but Jewish tradition will say, and here's the Jewishness of Kabbalah, you got to start with mitzvah. You can't just jump into theology if you don't have practice. You know, you can't, you know, you can't run a marathon if you've never worn tennis shoes. You, know, you have to practice. So would that not have to perform Judaism? No. Because we understand mitzvah, whether or not we follow all mitzvot, you know, I mean, it's not a matter, you know, I, I would, my Orthodox colleagues disagree, they would say you have to follow mitzvot, and then you get to Kabbalah. But I don't agree with that statement. Well, then why couldn't non-Jews understand mitzvot and they, they may be able to. But they don't approach it from that level. So, so Madonna didn't know square one about basic Judaism before she signed up in a class at the Kabbalah Center in LA. And he's talking about the marriage between God and, and, and humanity, which is not really what Kabbalah is. It's the marriage between God and Israel. But he made it universalistic. And, they're hooked, you know. She wasn't the only one. <laughs> so, so I'm, I'm, I'm just suggesting that there is, and, and, and we'll, we'll look at a story in a little bit um, um, to illustrate this. But if I were trying to boil all of Kabbalah down to one issue is this. How do you understand the relationship, the intimate personal relationship between God and you? So first you begin with mitzvah and then you grow that relationship. Because mitzvah is like doing the chores. You know, you're building a relationship. You gotta do the chores. You know, you gotta take out the trash. You gotta wash the windows. You gotta mop the floors. But you want something more out of your relationship than just the chores of living together. You want an emotive, personal, meaningful, and deep sharing of person. Place. And that's where Kabbalah rests. But if you never take out the trash and you never wash the floors or, or, or do the laundry, if you never build the relationship through mitzvah and think you can just jump to the, you know, the, that deep emotional bond, well, we all know that's not the way relationships are built. You don't just jump there. 
we got to build them from the ground up. Could someone acquire the feeling or the spirit of Kabbalah without the knowledge? If they start off, say, a pious person with a great knowledge of its vote, but they didn't study Kabbalah, could they evolve to wherever it is that Kabbalah takes people? So, that's a good question. Can a fully committed, fully engaged, Orthodox Jew, Reformed Jew, Conservative Jew, find this kind of relationship without ever going to that level? And the mystics would say that it's possible but it's improbable. And they would say, because this is an intentional place, and the other path takes you there accidentally. Which means that, you know, you're still doing the work and working on the relate, you know, you're still doing that stuff. Um, and yeah, it could happen. The mystics, though, were much more intentional. And so they took that intention and embedded it in practice and story so that they could, in essence, create this intimacy over and over again. And they are also the first to say, that that intimacy is never permanent. In other words, you don't get there and stay. You get there, it flashes, and you fall. It's like the ladder, Jacob's ladder. Angels ascending and descending. They never stop at the top. They're always going up and down and up and down. And that's how <coughs> the mystics understood this relationship. It's never something you acquire and remain at. And that's what a lot of people want. They want to acquire that sense, that place, that purpose, and remain there. But you know, you can't. You never really remain there. So, Kabbalah is this relationship and to understand it, um, we're going to look at a number of different texts. Um, there are a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of different layers of Kabbalah, which meant, which mean, so there are Kabbalistic texts which deal with. Midrash, commentary, Torah, understanding Torah. And that's what I, I, want, I just kind of want to unpack a little bit. It's my favorite Kabbalistic understanding of Torah. So the first line of Torah is Bereshit. So the first line of Torah is Bereshit bara Elohim et Hashemayim et Haaretz. Um, which means, as you look at different translations, 
the King James English, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Emphasis on the. If you look at our current translations, you see different versions. So the JPS translation says, at the beginning of God's creation of heaven and earth. Another modern translation says, and, and actually if you parse it out, you would say, in a beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So the Kabbalists are already, are already struggling. Why does, for example, why would the Torah begin with the letter Bet? It's the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Why wouldn't it begin with an Aleph? That's the first letter. What would be a good reason for it to begin with a Bet versus an Aleph? There's would, no, no good word that started with <laughs> to kick things off. <laughs> so, you could have said, Elohim, God, bara, God created, et hashemayim, et aris. Well, you didn't even need that first word, bereshi. You just could have started with Elohim. Wouldn't it make sense to start with Elohim? I mean, God's writing the book. Why don't you start by saying God created the heaven and the earth? That would solve everybody's problem. All right? But we threw this word in here, Bereshit. So what does the bet signify? It's not the first. Something with creation. Something came before. Okay. To emphasize its place in the timeline. Emphasize its place in the timeline. Well, I like uh, the concept that uh, at the start of the day, that kind of concept, because if you really uh, look at that God created and finished, it's very hard to explain free will. But if it's a continuing evolution of the creation, then it's a little easier to explain free will. Okay. So how does a bet do that? Oh, because I thought that was what gives us the definition of when you were saying, not necessarily in the beginning or at the beginning, but at a at, but there was some phrase we used. When before. God began. Yes. Okay. And then all right. Like completion. Uh, all right. Okay. Actually, all of those answers, while very valid, were all wrong. <laughs> all right. <laughs> the rabbis come along and say the first, the first, uh, the Torah begins with the letter Bet because the letter bet is closed on one side and opened to the future. So it's closed here, okay? And it's opened up as if it, you know, here's the text, because you know, Hebrew's going that direction. And so it is an open-ended beginning to the text. It's a higher All right? <laughs> now, it's interesting, right? So that's a mystical interpretation. There's absolutely nothing in here that would give some rise to that. But it's not the only mystical interpretation. Because a guy named Nachmanides gave us another one. And Nachmanides came along and said, in ancient Hebrew texts, there were no spaces between words. And everything we know to be the standard Hebrew reading at the time of Nachmanides was only 300 years old. So, because the Masoretes were in the 9th century, Nachmanides is in the 12th century. And so the Masoretic text was the accepted normative reading of the Bible. 
that didn't exist until the ninth century. But what if there was another reading? Who's to say the Massarines were right? And so what Maimonides does is he changes it. So Baroche, Yeet, Vara, same letters forming different words. Baroche, Yeet, Vara, Elohim. Et hashemayim, kama ve'et ha'aretz. Now, what does that mean? In the outset, so at the first, he, whoever he is, God was created. Yit bara Elohim. God was created in the, at the outset. Who created Elohim? So that, that's the huge pause that mysticism bases its entire understanding of, because in order to understand the marriage, you've got to understand the players. Who's God? Is God a figment of the creation of some individual? Is there something other than Elohim that was at play here? And they know the answer. And the answer is something called So before this could happen, the mystics say that there was Ain Sof. There was something Ain Sof without an end. And so they create a whole cosmology of creation based upon the question that Nachmanides poses. Because what happens before the bet? Is this ex nihilo out of nothing? <clears throat> or is there something there? What could have happened? You know, so there was there was Shemayim, there was Aretz, heaven, earth. Okay? Where do they come from? Did they just exist? Well, to the mystics, nothing ever just exists. There has to be a reason for something to exist. Everything exists for a reason. Even the duck-billed platypus exists for a reason. And so why, do the, why are the mystics caught up in this? Because they want to understand the reason. Why do we exist? What is our purpose? And it's more than just to have a family and a career and you know, make the world a better place because of our presence. That's a modern value. You know, what is God's intentionality in causing us to exist? Because they did believe that God caused us to exist. And so, what was the intentionality in causing Elohim to exist? Why is this important? Because later on we're going to have yod hey vav hey Adonai. So Adonai is not here. Is Adonai the person, the, you know, the, the he that's behind Elohim? Is Adonai ain't self? by a different name? That's a great question. 
That's what the mystics want to know. And so they're going to pull apart every letter of creation to try and figure out how did this happen? Because it's not enough to simply read this simple reading and say, God said, let there be light, and there was light. Something else had to happen. Then I'm assuming they would also be troubled by evolution. In other words, if they truly were into God literally all the way through, then evolution would not be something they could also look at. You know, it's interesting. I did a little work this week in some of my Komashin. And even in the Orthodox translations which I have, the understanding that the creation story as the Torah describes it, not being the first creation, is understood by even the orthodox translations of the text. So there are no orthodox translations today that say, in the beginning. So they all have some little hickey, and that's because we've had a thousand years of commentary saying, is it a bet? Is it a ba? Is it bo? Is it what does it mean to have that bet there? And so they've they've become a part of that process of interpretation. So do, does traditional Judaism accept the idea of evolution? My experience is absolutely. Um, because they understand this creation, <clears throat> the one we're in, as the latest creation. And the Midrash suggests that prior to the creation of this creation, God was in the business of creating and destroying worlds. And so for them, you know, the Noah story with the flood, and then after the flood, the rainbow, and God says, I'm not going to destroy the world by a flood anymore, is really important. You know, because I always wondered, well, first, I always thought that, you know, in the beginning, blah, 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 and he said it was good. First of all, I answered on that. You know? I always wondered why he'd say it was good. Did he not know? I mean, it implies the multiples. So, so you know, that's this is why, for me, mysticism is is a draw because it asks questions in a way that I've never really considered. When you grow up in a fairly, you know, rational, you know, liberal household, where you're using reason to kind of address what your faith teaches you, to look at the world from a, a different lens is, is a real opportunity to explore the depth of your faith. So for me, Kabbalah is the key to a door that has, that is ultimately bottomless or limitless, if you will. And that's where I've gone in trying to comprehend. What does it mean? It means it means there's no answers. For some of us, that would be painful, that there's no answers. What if there were just questions? What if questions led to other questions and led to other questions? Maybe it's not about the 
answer. Maybe it's just about the question. And I think that's what Kabbalah opened for me. You tried to explain what Kabbalah is, and then when you went to the word for sheet and said, oh, close on one side and open on the other side, and that's mysticism. <coughs> I don't know how you, I, the relationship, the marriage between God and Israel, but when you have a word and you describe this letter and say that's mystic, mysticism, uh -huh. Kabbalah and mysticism are the same, how is that, how, is, how do you come to the sentence, that's mysticism because it describes the letter as closed here and open there? Right. So, so let's go there. So in that packet of material, Go to the first page. Well, the second page. <clears throat> All of Jewish mystical exploration begins with a story. It's a story that is in the Talmud about the Pardes. The Pardes is a Hebrew word for orchard. And it's almost the story of the Garden of Eden. Okay? Now, Pardes Pardes is also a an across. And, it, and its acrostic is the most important understanding of biblical hermeneutics that lead to mysticism. So, what I mean is, the first word is, and I'm going to just go ahead. Shot. Remez, Drosh, so. So if you took the yeah, if you took the first letter of each, you know, it would be Hey Reish Dalin So let's read this story. The rabbis taught. Four sages entered the pardes, literally the orchard. They achieved spiritual elevation through intense meditation on God's name. They were Ben Azai, Ben Zoma, Acher, who was really Alicia ben Abuya, and Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva said to them prior to their ascension, remember ascension, think about that, when you come to the place of pure marble stones, do not say water, water, for it is said, he who speaks untruths shall not stand before my eyes. Then as I gazed at the divine presence and died. Regarding him, the verse states, precious in the eyes of God is the death of his pious ones. Ben Zoma gazed and was harmed. He lost his sanity. Regarding him, the verse states, did you find honey? Eat only as much as you need, lest you be overfilled and vomited up. Acher cut down the plantings, meaning he became a heretic. Rabbi Akiva entered in peace and left in peace. So this Midrashic parable that is in the Talmud is the basis for all mystical texts. And it's caught up in this and it's caught up in 
the idea of preparation. So here's the situation, four rabbis. These four rabbis are the great rabbis of the, of the Talmudic generation. They are immensely embedded in mitzvah. They are overwhelmingly knowledgeable of all of Jewish life and lore. And the four of them are going to have this mystical experience. And they do so by meditating on the names of God. How many names of God are there? There are 72 different names for God in the Bible. And there's a book, you can buy it, Names of God, 72 Names. <laughs> Somewhere in my library in a storage unit in Houston, I have that book. <laughs> I don't have it here. But there's 72 names. And they meditate on the names thinking, on the other side, if, if they get to really know God through the names, they'll be closer to that marriage, to, to, be, to being that intimate with God. And there's this caution, and the caution is really important because they're going to see something. And what they see, they have to see clearly. And Rabbi Akiva warns them that it's going to look like something else. And if you say what it looks like, which is wrong, something bad is going to happen to you. Because that means you're not prepared enough. You're not ready. So Rabbi Akiva is the only one who knows this, who sees what he sees, who emerges unscathed. The other three rabbis see the same thing, call it different things, maybe succumb to their own emotion, if you will, and the harm comes of them. The most important is Alicia Benabuya because he became a heretic. Now what it means by becoming a heretic means he was so taken by the philosophical engagement of what he saw that he turned to the study of philosophy to explain it and left Judaism. And he became a philosopher which is different than a rabbi. Why would these people be allowed to ascend if they were not ready? It almost seems like you're getting on the airplane without going through security. Mm -hmm. So all mystical texts describe, so there's, 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 there's levels of readiness. You can be ready and fail. And that's what it's described. They were ready. They had all the information they needed. They would have kept their freaking mouth shut and would have emerged fine. Um, and, but what they didn't do is that. I mean, the Kiva was the only one. So, so they, so the story describes what happens when that, when you're, when you are ready, but unprepared. Okay, because you can be ready, but not prepared for what you see. Um, so this parable, there's this long explanation of this parable, 
which I would encourage you to read. Um, the Zohar talks about it, and there's in the, the commentary is from the Tikkun Zohar, which is a, a Zohar commentary on this story, and it's really, really very important. But it's it's in the text. It's, it's right there. Yeah. So I copied the whole piece. It was. Um, so, so now, um, we have the pardes. And the pardes itself is an important image for mysticism. Because it's the orchard. What's the orchard? Well, for a lot of the mystics, it's the Garden of Eden. And they understood this journey to the garden. I have lots of copies. Don't worry. Uh, that, that these people are trying to get back to the Garden of Eden. What's the Garden of Eden represent? The Messiah, Messianism. And if they can get back there, they can restore humanity to the garden. What was Adam, what was it like in the garden? God walked with humanity. There's no separation. The marriage is complete. And, and that's what they wanted. You know, I mean, that's ultimately their goal. Um, and so we have Pardes. Pardes is, for Torah study, a very important image. And it suggests that there's four levels of knowledge. The shot is the symbol. Remnants, yes. Drash is story. And so. Um, and most of us spend our time up here with the simple reading of a text where we read Bereshit, bara Elohim, and Toshamayim, and Taharats. In a beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And we say, so there's, there's a beginning. God created, and then we read about the days of creation. That's the simple reading. Right? Great. Remnants are the hints. How did God create? Why did God create? What did God create? How did God create? Was it just through words? Did God have tools? We know if we want to build something, we got to have a tool. The book of creation is a book, a mystical text about how God created tools to create the world and what those tools were. They were the Hebrew letters. Each letter is a tool. And if you mix them up and mash them together, they create words. The words were simply the result of the tools fitting together. So the letter olive and the letter shin creates fire. So when you put the olive and the shin together, this tool to that tool, you create something. You create fire. And that's what the book of creation describes. It actually described God having this huge ethereal wheel, two of them. One with the letters on one level, actually three wheels. There were three wheels because in Hebrew, everything has a root of three letters, every word. 
So there were three wheels, and they would spin independently. And God would push a button, and they would stop. Blackjack. <laughs> Boom. And that would be the thing that was created, where the letters lined up. And that's what the book of creation describes. It's imaginative, for sure. But for the rabbis, it's, it's, it's the tool. It's how does, God, how does God create? You can't just say, Abracadabra, another Jewish word. It's actually avara ke adabra, Aramaic. Avara ke adabra, I will create as I speak. Abracadabra. Yep. Aramaic. So, so, so that it was more than that. We can't just simply create because we want to. We have to have attention. We have to have tools. And the mystics try to understand those tools. Because all God does is speak. But that's not enough. There had to be something more. So what's the story? We're going to look at the story of creation next week. And then the secrets. So sometimes as you, as you read a text, you see something that just doesn't fit. A word, a phrase, an idea. Something that might be challenging. And that's the secret. That's the soul going beneath the surface to something much deeper. So, so this, this, essence, this essential story of the rabbis entering the garden gives birth to this whole idea of the garden as the garden of knowledge. And in the garden of knowledge, there's different fruits and vegetables. There's different layers different things. And the rabbis kept wanting to get deeper and deeper to the root system of the garden to try and understand it. So that's a very important story. So do the four rabbis represent each one of those uh, levels of not really, um, because one would make, you know, so Alicia Benabuya, they have such a problem with him, because he became a philosopher, that they renamed him in the Talmud. Acher, which means other. So they crossed his name out and wrote other. Because they wouldn't want us, they didn't want to say his name, even though they kept his positions or opinions on certain topics in the Talmud. All right? So so I, I don't know that he would fit up here. You know. At some point, Moses is told to avert his gaze because he cannot see, look on God, or he will die. Yet all these people do, and not all of them die. Does this mean that Moses was at a, our great leader, was at a lower level, knowledge-wise, preparation-wise, than these four rabbis? Well... The last, last, last chapter of Torah refers to Moses as the only one who knew God face to face. 
So yes, Moses chooses to avert his face. God didn't tell him to. At the burning bush, Moses says, I can't look at you or I'll die. But later on, we know Moses is the only one that does look. Um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, this is a midrash, okay? It's a midrash that has such an amazing power in the world of the mystical text that, um, you know, I think that will be, it'll be important for us to keep coming back to it. Um, so let's, let's, you know, we'll take a few more minutes and let's, step back and talk a little bit about some, some definitions. So, you know, when you think about mysticism, how do you define it? What do you think about it? For me, it would be uh, trying to uh, still my conscious stream of thought and be a little more open to uh, other things. Okay. So, um, yeah, I have a couple of definitions, a few ideas. Um, a lot of people view mysticism as some kind of union. Union, communion, marriage between two people, that there's, that, that mystical traditions deal in spatial relationships. And when we look at mysticism, um, you know, I think it was William James who defines religious experience of this level as unio mystica, mystical union. Um, cleaving to something in a spiritual way. Um, one definition is the belief in a direct, intimate union of the soul with God through contemplation and love. So it focuses in on the soul. Not the mind. That's why a lot of Reformed Jews have a problem with mysticism. Because it's not about the mind, it's about the soul. And that's something we don't know a lot about. We know we have one, at least we hope we do. But we don't know what it looks like, smells like, tastes like, or acts like. We only know it exists. Well, the Zohar tries to explore the soul and gives us a way to comprehend it. We'll get there. Um, some people define mysticism as a cult. Those are rationalists. You know, it's too, too frou frou, too, too, yeah, too bizarre. Right. Mm -hmm. There are. That's why it's a good question. <laughs> there are rabbis who define it as, as a cult. Um, which is different than occult, um, because they view it as a distraction. Mysticism is a distraction for a lot of people. Um, that's why I asked, why are, you know, at the beginning, why are you here? You know, what do you hope to find? I don't know what you hope to. I don't know what. I don't know what I hope to find when I read a mystical text. Um, I just hope to be somewhat enlightened in a way that I wasn't before. Incrementally, not catastrophically. 
Some people are looking for catastrophic enlightenment. You can't find that in mysticism. Um, I found this interpretation in one of uh, in, a, in, in a book called Nine and a Half Mystics, which is actually a very good book if anyone's looking for a simple overview. Of Jewish mysticism. It's written by a woman named Pearl Epstein. It's paperback. I think it's probably published by Penguin. <laughs> but it's nine and a half mystics. Um, but it is the total submission of the human will and intellect to God. And I put that down because it sounds like something else to me. What other tradition is about total submission? Islam. Yeah. Yeah. Islam is all about submission. Where does mystical tradition get its beginnings? Good question. It's a good point. And the answer is yes. <laughs> so the answer is yes, we have a will. Um, yes, our will is independent. And yes, our will is determined. And how, 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 how does that happen? You know, so, so it's left to, to Maimonides, which says, you know, Maimonides' great statement is, all is foreseen, yet free will is given. It's the, it's I'm still perplexed. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, me too. paradox. Total submission of the human will. <coughs> so a lot of mystical traditions got their beginnings in pagan mysticism. <coughs> most notably the Zoroastrians. Um, so if you went back, you know, six, seven hundred years before the creation of Jewish mystical texts, you would find mystical literature written by the Zoroastrians who were pretty pagan in their approach, probably the precursors to Islam, um, a thousand years later, of course, but, you know. And they, they had a mystical tradition. So submission may have been a part of it. That may be where that definition comes from. Um, so, you know, again, you know, it has its roots in pagan culture. Um, Judaism did not invent mystical interpretation. Um, this is somewhat towards your question at the beginning, was where is it really Jewish? What Judaism does is embed mysticism in a Torah-centric world. So mysticism is not in place of Torah, it is in addition to. And that's what the rabbis say over and over again, is that in order to have this mystical knowledge, you have to 
be embedded in Judaism. We can't sit on the fence and, and have this. Um, later on, it also became, you know, you had to be 40 years old. You know, why do you have to be 40 years old? Because Moses wandered the wilderness for 40 years. The Israelites wandered the wilderness for 40 years. You know, the, the flood was 40 days. You know, Moses was on Mount Sinai for 40 days. You know, the number 40 comes up over and over again, and it's a number of that represents purity. Cleansing. In the first 40 years of your life are not very clean. All right? But after that, you get a little cleaner. You have a little different attitude or perspective or purpose. And the mystics understood that too. People are trying, trying to build themselves in those first 40 years. The, uh seems like a lot of numerology um, and it seems like what you were saying is more letterology. So, I mean, is this really some way of really trying to <coughs> uh, math and literacy uh, in two primal communication skills within the context of understanding the larger Organization. Well, there's certainly a, um, a strong history of numerology in Judaism, where the letters become numbers. Um, Does it go the other way around, where the numbers become letters? Um, X trumps numbers? Well, I'm not sure how it, so, so we get to the number of 613, and then we have, you know, I mean, there's some, some midrashim for sure. You know, so here's the, here's the big numerology piece. The word Torah in Hebrew, if you counted the letters, equals 611. Why are there 613 commandments if the word itself only equals 611? Why? Got a reason? Well, the Torah has a reason. And the Torah says that at Mount Sinai, the first two commandments were spoken by God in a loud voice. And the people were so afraid that they shut their ears then and said to Moses, you go get them. So they heard the first two and then they were gifted the other 611. So is that mysticism? Is that Midrash? Is there is there some deeper sense of, of tradition happening? Um, the answer is yes, it's all of the above. It just depends on your kind of view of that moment. Um, so, so that, you know, so we know there's 613 commandments. Now we're trying to figure out why. If the word chosen to represent those commandments is lacking, the rational mind would say it's the wrong question to ask. <laughs> so why would anyone ever ask that question? Right. Exactly. And and that's what you know. That's why you know Reform Judaism totally abandoned this whole mystical tradition until the, you know, probably the, the early 80s. You know, it just wasn't known. We didn't, when I did my 
When I did my, my, my dissertation in rabbinic school, nobody, none of the faculty, I had to, my dissertation was a comparison of the Aeneans of Plotinus and Sefer Hechelo Rabati. So Greek philosophy and Jewish mysticism was a comparison. Nobody on the faculty had any experience in mysticism and reading Hechelo Rabati. Now, I had a professor that was a philosophy professor, and we, we, he and I could, could deal with the Plotinus text. But who was I going to do this Aramaic mystical text with? And I found a professor of Talmud who was willing to study with me in order to have my, my advisors. Now that was 1986. Now there's some people at the college with some background. Since the mid 80s, there's been kind of an explosion, unfolding of mystical study. Books being written, you know, the whole, the whole series on the Zohar that's coming. Isn't this a reaction to the popularity of Zen and Eastern meditation? And people say, Why, wait a minute, doesn't our own tradition have some, some of this stuff? Could be. Could be. Think just, about all that. Yeah, it's just people that I knew who got into that, got into mm -hmm. that almost mm -hmm. an extension of Zen Buddhism. Right. So, where else does it come from? Okay. Mysticism comes from the cross-breeding of ideas. So my, my question that I asked in my, 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 my document was, which came first? Plotinus or Sefer Hechelo Rabati? They describe exactly the same thing. Who came first? Can't prove it. They both exist in the same time, in the same milieu. What preceded them? Well, the only thing that really preceded them was Alexander. And as Alexander traipsed from Greece all the way to Babylon and back, or to India and back, um, he left behind all this stuff. At the same time, Plotinus was with Alexander. You know? So, you know, is that how we get mysticism? Or did we create things before that? Um, the symbolism of the burning bush and Jacob's ladder, um, you know, prior to more formal interest in Zohar? I mean, were there mystical drashas on that prior to uh, I mean, they, they saw in Ezekiel, I mean, there's a lot of mystical... Right, so, so, is, so uh, Ezekiel is a, is a whole different story. Um, but yes, I mean, I don't know if there are mystical drashas, but there's a huge wealth of Midrashim would you consider them mystical? I don't know. Um, but you know, the early mystical texts all are dealing with the creation story. But that's the, 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 the rabbis are fixated on understanding creation. Um, and so then they move on to this kind of journey literature that's very similar to Plotinus. This idea of levels of engagement and forms and you know, perfection versus imperfection. 
And from that grows the idea of Gnosticism, which is embedded in the church of this dualism. Um, and so, you know, the, the free market of ideas in the first three or four centuries of the Common Era gave birth to so much that we're still parsing it out today. Just, uh, sorry, um, just out of curiosity, is there um, a similarity at all between mysticism, Judaism, and the like, concept of supernatural in, in Judaism? Because I know that there is a lot of that sort of storytelling or supernatural right. aspect. In so there are definitely in the mystical traditions of the first few centuries of the Common Era, angelology, um, you know, kind of this, this whole idea of, of supernatural beings that you come in contact with as you move through the levels of relationship to God. Has anyone ever sort of theorized that that could tie into the concept of, you know, temptation and all that within Well, it's more along the lines of the of the of the Akiva story of knowing what you see and being truly confident. So there's a lot of you know. So so the text that I did my work on Sefer Hechelo Rabat describes the journey from this world through seven worlds to the gates of the eighth world where God resides. And at each level, as you approach each gate, there are supernatural creatures, some like the ones described in Ezekiel, that stand as guardians and are there not to tempt you, but to defeat you. Um, and so you have to be prepared and know your stuff and whatever. Um, it's not so much temptation, although the Akiva story is about temptation. You'll be tempted to say water, water, but it's really not water and you shouldn't say anything. Um, So I just want to kind of conclude. We're going to we're going to look at a lot of experiences, um, different texts. Um, we're going to explore. My favorite passage in the Zohar is the discussion of the Zohar about the human soul, and the, that we each have actually three souls, and we'll learn what they do, why they're different. Um, we have some mystical literature in our prayer book, for sure. The Lachadadi is a mystical poem. Um, and there's another mystical poem that we read at Shavuot, coming up in, the, in, uh, in May, called the Akdamut, which is a, a, a mystical liturgical poem as well. About the about Mount Sinai, um, so we'll look at a couple of those. Um, Rav Cook, who was the first chief rabbi of the state of Israel, 1948. Okay, said that mysticism is the salt which makes the meat of Jewish law more palatable. So, <laughs> so I'm going to leave you with that idea. <laughs>